from 1933 to 1953, the library sponsored what it called the Book Review and Lecture Forum. And this was uh, every month a gathering open to the public where authors would come in and talk about their works. And not just the works they had published, but the works they were in progress with. Um, people like Zora Neale Hurston, Richard Wright, Gwendolyn Brooks, Langston Hughes, Arta Bontemps, um, Frank Marshall Davis would come and read from their, their works to audiences of hundreds of people would turn out for these things. Plus, the group also met to talk about books. Um, they would uh, gather together a selection committee that was nominated and appointed by library and library patrons would select reading fair for the, the season. And they would have discussions. And um, that, there was no way I could think about why Chicago became central to African American literary life without thinking about this library and this group. Um, and she was a remarkable woman. Um, as the archivists at the Harsh Collection now tell us, um, she was eulogized as a historian who never wrote. Um, this is a woman who cared passionately about African American history, um, but came to that understanding and that commitment in a really interesting way. But Harsh was born here in Chicago in 1890, and this fact matters. Um, because her parents had migrated here from Tennessee. They were both college graduates uh, of Fisk University. It matters that they came here to Chicago so early because the family belonged to what was known as the Old Settlers Club. And this was a group of the elite blacks who settled Chicago apart from the great migrations that occurred later in the 20th century. This matters to, to Harsh how we understand Harsh because she was reared in an environment to think of herself as exceptional. And they remember her as being incredibly proper, very stern, had very severe rules for how uh, children and adults should behave in her library, um, which seems to befit the old settler mm -hmm. tr training that she came up with. But by that same token, she ran a library that was extraordinarily accessible. I think it's remarkable that here in Chicago, there is more African-American owned access to the means of literary production, by which I mean we have more African-Americans publishing magazines, journals, newspapers that promote and foster uh, literary writing. Um, short stories are being uh, published in newspapers, poetry, novel, um, serialized fiction. But newspapers become, and these are black-owned venues. African-American writers working in New York in the 1920s did not have that kind of access. And again, remember, writers are going to Hall Branch Library. They're going to the Southside Community Arts Center. They're going to the um, Abraham Lincoln Center. They're going to the, uh, to the Parkway Community House. And all of this is along this stretch from about 38th to 48th along Michigan and, um, and in State Street as well, that, that, that the readers are engaging with the authors whose books they're buying or whose serials they're reading in the newspaper. And that kind of contact in the accounts I've read of literary Harlem in the 1920s just didn't happen. I absolutely feel that this is the beginning, it's the tip of an iceberg um, that's going to reveal to the rest of the scholarly world where these other hidden archives are that tell the history of this moment. And I'm absolutely convinced that we don't know more about this period because we don't know where the evidence is. And if we knew where the evidence is, we'd have to confront it, we'd have to deal with it. And it's going to tell us a far more complicated history than we, than we could ever dream of.